Great. Well, we'll welcome all of y'all for joining this uh, World Urban Parks, World Parks Academy, Canadian Parks and Rec Association presentation and webinar on emerging services being delivered in our urban parks. Um, I'm going to drag just for a second and let people begin dialing in, but we have about an hour's worth of a presentation for you today with some just great colleagues that I know you're going to get a lot out of and, and hear a lot sharing from as well. So we'll just give this just about a minute to let folks begin to dial themselves in and get comfortable and do all the liquid refreshment adjustments that you have to do one direction or another. All righty. Well, I'll do the intro. Um, for those of you that don't know, World Urban Parks is happy to sponsor this program with you. Uh, we are a small but emerging group of folks that work obviously around the globe. Uh, working on issues just like this and realizing that we share a lot more in common with each other than we may recognize because if COVID taught us anything, uh, it taught us that things move very quickly from city to city and we may have more in common with the city across a little bit of water than we do with the city right across the street from us. And World Urban Parks is an effort of a bunch of us that think collaborating in that framework will help all of us do our jobs better. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about us as an organization, uh, check out the website you see here on your screen or look at any of those fine social media platforms and you can learn more about us. We would love to have you get involved. Michael Cleland and myself are your North American co-pilots. Um, and as long as we don't crash this boat into the ocean, we see some really exciting things coming forward as we collaborate more. And, and we're really, I'll tell you all, um, the COVID experience and the isolation has opened our eyes up because we're all a lot more comfortable with technology and doing these video conferences and stuff. But the amount of exchange and information moving now, I've never seen anything like it in my career. It's exciting. It's a passionate group of people that are out here problem solving for discussions like this. And I think it's something that you'll find worth your time if you wanna fire up your career and fire up your staff and your team members. Uh, we have a variety of folks that are on the organization. You probably recognize some of those names. I'm sure a lot of folks rep recognize Gil Penaloso because once you've heard Gil once, you've heard Gil. Um, but he's our ambassador and does a, an absolutely beautiful job um, and, and communicating this. And we'd love to have you all on board. And just real quick, here is the map showing you the North American representation. We'd love to see more green dots. Um, today's talk is gonna be focused on, on something that's, that's very close to this yank, uh, one of our great songwriters we lost this last year, John Prine. If any of y'all are, are friends uh, and fans of American music, um, one of our great songwriters and storytellers. And, and really the truth of today's talk is about all of us just doing what we do, which is we do the best we can every day. And we are very blessed and fortunate to have some great speakers with us today who do that in their careers. And you've probably seen it if you've been to their cities uh, and their communities to share the information that they have with us. So that's the introduction for World Urban Parks. It's my pleasure now to turn it over to Michael Cleland, who's going to give you an introduction for Canada. And then we're going to go right into a discussion with the panelists. Please post your questions in the chat or in the discussion as you do before and we'll leave time at the end for any Q&As afterwards. And then you will get a copy of this chat as well, mailed to you directly at the end of the presentation as well. So with that, I will shut my large pie hole um, and let the real stars talk. Michael, this floor is yours. Thank you very much, Scott. And good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Michael Cleland. Uh, Scott and I work together on the World Urban Parks Board, uh, but I'm also the past, uh, President Chair of the Canadian Parks and Recreation Association. And our uh, CPRA uh, partners with World Urban Parks on a broad range of, of initiatives uh, and offers support uh, to programs like this as well. So I'd like to, first of all, welcome everybody uh, to, to this session. And um, I'd like to first begin by acknowledging that CPRA is located on the unceded traditional territory of the Algonquin and Mohawk First Nations. We want to use this as an intentional and thoughtful way uh, to offer thankful recognition to the Indigenous communities that continue to be the traditional stewards of our lands and of our parks. We're thrilled to welcome you all today to our webinar. So I first like to uh, 
just pull up my screen here and, and get my notes together. Uh, I'd first like to introduce um, Donna, Donna Lynn Rosa. She's a general manager. She'll be a speaker today, uh, general manager of the Vancouver Parks and Recreation Board. Uh, Donna and I have had the great privilege of working together in a few, few parts, a few times of our career. Uh, and it's so great to see Donna, Donna Lynn leading, leading her team in Vancouver. And she, you know, uh, I think in signing in, many of you have maybe heard her speak on, on the topics that Vancouver is dealing with. You've probably heard her on the news recently talking about uh, coyotes. Um, but this time she'll be talking uh, specifically to, to us about encampments. Donna Lynn has worked uh, across Canada uh, in many senior roles in British Columbia, as well as in Ontario, uh, as the president-elect for the British uh, Columbia Parks and Recreation Association. She also serves on the board of directors of the Canadian Parks and Recreation Association. Uh, so welcome, Donna, and I look forward to, uh, to uh, hearing your presentation a little later on. And I'd also like to draw everyone's attention to Greg Weitzel. He's the Director of Parks and Recreation for the City of Las Vegas. Uh, Greg is also a member of the National Board of Directors for the uh, National Parks and Recreation Association in the United States, um, and uh, has held several uh, other positions, uh, leadership positions in the recreation and parks movement across uh, the US. I think in Allen Allenstown, Pennsylvania and uh, Idaho Falls, Idaho. Uh, Greg and I spend a little time together um, uh, with, with senators and uh, representatives uh, trying to, to bring attention and draw funding support for conservation efforts in the United States. Um, this was uh, before COVID. Uh, it was a great privilege to spend a few days with you and your team learning learning how that's done in the American way, Greg. And, and no doubt, uh, now that you're in, in, in Vegas, I'm really interested in hearing how you approach a number of these uh, issues in terms of management and strategy uh, of vulnerable populations in and around the park, park spaces that we look after. And uh, Scott, his uh, co-chair, uh, of the Rural Urban Parks uh, North American Committee with, with myself. Scott, uh, you don't need uh, probably much of an introduction, but I'll turn it over to you <laughs> because you're so well known, Scott. You do these all the time, uh, but you're the executive director of, uh, of your conservancy in, uh, in Indiana. So I look forward to uh, uh, listening to the speakers today. Scott's gonna take it on from here in terms of um, giving, giving our speakers the time and space and facilitating the conversations uh, that come out of this. Again, make sure that you do leave some time uh, and comments in the chat box for us to follow and plan for. Over to you, Scott. All right, so we're gonna go uh, full-fledged alphabetical, um, which means for the first time in, in a while, Donnie, you get to go first. Um, if we wanna start you up and, and take it away, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I'm going to uh, share my screen the best I can here. Uh, please do let me know that it's working. Is that uh, coming across nicely? Yep. Thank you. Uh, so I'm joining you from the unceded ancestral territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil people. Um, I'm in what's known as Vancouver today. Uh, I am not a homelessness uh, expert at all. I'm not a housing. Uh, I don't know much about housing. Uh, and I certainly had zero experience in decamping. Um, uh, any, and, and quite frankly, zero experience in encampments. When I took this job on in October, last October, about a year ago, almost a year ago, uh, when I joined, the, uh, the encampment at Strathcona Park had grown to be one of the largest in Canada, uh, peaking at about 500 uh, people. I, um, th this encampment lasted uh, 347 days. And um, I, I should say that to, to call this complex would be just such a gross understatement. 
Um, here in Vancouver, we have an elected board for the Board of Parks and Recreation. So I, I report to a board that's that's separately elected to oversee parks and recreation. Uh, it's the only one of its kind in Canada. Um, we also have city council. Uh, we, of course, have the province. Uh, we have the health department. And this took uh, a combination of all of us coming to the table to work together to, um, uh, to address the encampment. So today I'm gonna to talk a little bit about how we approached uh, the campers, the community uh, and the business, or uh, surrounding business. I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we collaborated across uh, the many levels of government uh, necessary from the park board, the city, the province, the health, um, and, and what we needed to do to, um, to make this encampment safe and to move people indoors. I'm also uh, going to focus a little bit on the values that we brought to this work. And I think that um, the values guided us in every decision. We didn't get it right. We got it wrong a lot of the time. I learned an awful lot from this, um, but we tried to root ourselves in um, a trauma-informed approach, uh, harm reduction and reconciliation. And so, you would be amazed at how many decisions you make along the way that if you go back to that as your base um, uh, values, uh, it it really challenges you because doing this work in a colonial setting is, um, and, and in colonial constructs that we work within and institutions that we work within is really challenging. It's It, it doesn't align nicely. Um, we looked at harm reduction as, you know, as little enforcement, as a little police involvement, as little, as few uniforms on site as possible. And that's pretty challenging. We looked at trauma informed, um, you know, language. Language was really important. At some points, people would look at this and say, um, you know, we got to clean up this garbage. And the community would say, we got to clean up this garbage. And instead, we repositioned our thinking to, this is everything that this person owns in this world. This is their belongings. This is not garbage. This is their belongings and we need to treat it that way. Um, and reconciliation, when we came to the final weeks of the, um, or the beginning of the decampment, the, the last final weeks of the encampment, um, we started every day with ceremony, healing ceremony for the staff who were doing this work, for the community uh, who were experiencing homelessness, um, and, and for all of us to come together uh, and ground in our values. Uh, and it was really important that we did that. And I'm also going to talk a little bit about the mistakes we made, which were uh, plentiful. So as I mentioned, at, at its peak, uh, Strathcona Park was uh, the largest in Canada, if not North America, uh, 500 tents. Um, I have two bullets here. The surrounding community was outraged and the surrounding community was supportive. Uh, Strathcona community is a very interesting community. The park is surrounded um, to the south. You'll see on the, on the right, the mountains are to the north, to the south and east. There are businesses and directly to the north and west, there are uh, homes. Uh, Strathcona community is, has the um, poorest postal code in Canada for one third of its people. One third are working poor, and one third are living in million dollar homes, two million dollar homes. So it's a really unique community, uh, very uh, compassionate community. Um, some folks in this community were outraged at the living conditions and how long they were uh, in the encampment and how long folks were uh, left to live in that setting. Um, and some were outraged that the city and the park board weren't doing more to bring this encampment to an end. And some uh, on the very same Zoom calls were saying, uh, you need to work harder to make this encampment uh, safe and, and to support people living there. So it was a very polarizing conversation um, and we needed to work with all of them. We did do a lot of programming for the campers, um, whether it was arts programs, food sustainability programs. Um, this community was seen as part of the community for the, for the time that they were there. Um, we worked directly with the camp leadership to find out what folks needed for safety. So we did, uh, you know, fire came in and did some training around, um, you know, putting out fires around how to use, um, um, you know, the equipment needed and, and provided equipment so that folks could be safe, uh, provided information about not having propane tanks. Um, 
We also uh, worked with camp leadership to make sure that we had regular meetings with the camp. And, and this started, you know, October, November, uh, regular meetings with the camps, with the campers and the leadership to talk about some of their safety uh, issues. And um, to the point where, you know, there was somebody there who had a couple of dogs that uh, uh, weren't well trained and were, were a danger to others. And we brought in um, our partners in the uh, um, animal services who came in and did some training with folks to help uh, bring folks along in terms of managing their 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 animals. We worked with the camp leadership to provide um, washrooms um, as well as um, a warming tent in January, February. That's when we have our rain season. It's the coldest and wettest time. Uh, so to get people indoors, warm them up. Um, food, you know, food services were provided for folks as well as um, um, making sure that uh, health was in there to do safety checks. It was a really important time to get through until we were able to get partnerships developed with uh, those who would be providing indoor spaces. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, we used a harm reduction trauma-informed reconciliation lens. Um, and as we, as we experience in our encampments here, um, a disproportionate number of people are Indigenous people who are living on the streets and living in these encampments. And so making sure that we were um, trying to be as culturally appropriate as possible. For example, uh, when we met with leadership, it wasn't uncommon to bring food, um, meeting over food and uh, talking and building relationship uh, was really important. At one point, uh, you know, we had a tragic overdose in the encampment and I brought home baked cookies to the camp leader because I knew, I knew that she was, she was hurting over this and she felt responsible for the people in the, in the encampment. And, and this was a family member to her. Um, and so I wasn't there to talk about anything else, but just how she was doing. And I think it's really important for us to remember that, you know, we're all human beings trying to, you know, make this life work. And if we don't build relationships, if we just go in with a clipboard and tell people where to go, uh, we're not getting anywhere. And, and I learned this from the community um, who were very adamant that we needed to get to know each other before we could work together. Um, <clears throat> so three levels of government came together to sign a, an MOU, the city, the park board and the province. And, and basically this deal was that the city and the province would work together to provide indoor spaces, land and, and housing. And the park board would work to make sure that things were safe on the ground, but then that uh, that it was safely decamped. And so we set a date of April 30th. We uh, gave people heads up and then we worked together as a team to uh, get in there and actually move every individual. You know, we had moving trucks and we had bins and we had totes and we stored things and we didn't get it perfect. Uh, we made mistakes around that, but we really tried to help each individual uh, move into an indoor space that was uh, good for them and, and, and had the services they needed. So how we did it was, uh, this is a, a 10 acre park. What we did was we fenced off um, where it says no temporary shelters permitted. Um, we fenced that area off. Um, the other part of the, of the map was the, um, where the encampment was. Uh, we fenced it off. We worked to uh, test the soil, uh, remediate the soil, and as quickly as possible, return that space back to the community. And we did that so that the community would also have access to green space, but then the encampment would have their space. And, and what we did is when we opened up the no temporary shelter space, um, we actually fenced off the encampment at the request of, of the campers so that they could have uh, a little bit of control of who was coming in and who was going out and, and manage their space. Um, in the end, we moved uh, collaboratively uh, between BC Housing and the city, the outreach folks, and, and with the help of the park board, we moved uh, over 280 people indoors. Now, these weren't all, it wasn't, the intention wasn't that, uh, you know, you come to the park and, and you get housing. That's not how it works. Um, the timing was, was good for this. The, the folks were gathered there. Uh, at the park and we were able to make that work in this time. In today's encampments, we don't have that. We don't have right now um, uh, housing available. We have shelter spaces and indoor spaces available. One of the uh, agreements that my team had was that um, we had to have 
or not my team, the direction from my board was that there had to be enough indoor spaces to match the number of people needing indoor spaces. And so once we had that formula, that equation, we were able to move forward and work with each individual. This is just a story of somebody who had success and, and actually uh, uh, said to us how excited he was that he was going to actually be able to lock his door tonight. And that is the end of my presentation. And uh, I'll figure out how to unshare my screen, I think, somehow. Maybe. We have faith in you, Donnie. <laughs> oh, I wouldn't necessarily. Uh, I'll let you guys talk while I sort out how to. There we, there we go. Great. Thank you for that yeah. insightful deal. And we'll come back to it because I think. Um, yeah, you touched on the personal connection and the relationship piece. And, and I know that's going to be something we all come back to. It's, these are very personal, relational elements in very large cities where that personal connection, just because of the scale of our work, is really, really tough. Um, and we'll get into that, I'm sure, in a second. So thank you. Thank you for that that just really candid exploration, Donnie. Uh, none of us got into this with this sort of work. Um, before I turn it over to Greg, I'll a sidebar, I had a discussion with Happy Haynes from Denver Parks about a year ago and learned that her wildlife, one of her wildlife biologists had been tasked to help manage the homeless encampment situation, uh, speaking about a different skill set that maybe they went to grad school for. So with that, um, Greg, we will turn the floor over to you uh, from Las Vegas, where you're celebrating having an NFL franchise and all the celebration that goes with that, Greg. So if you would, sir, take it away. Thank you. Second here. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening to those joining from around the world. Um, I'm the Greg Weitzel, Director of Parks and Recreation for the City of Las Vegas, and it's my pleasure to be with you here today. So, Las Vegas, we are open for business, and we are all about building community to make life better. So we're, we are about tourism, as you know, 42.5 million visitors um, come to Las Vegas on a, a year. And we have more than 6.6 .6 million uh, convention, uh, those who attend conventions. Um, more than 289,000 people um, are supported through jobs by tourism here in our, our city. And as Scott mentioned, we're all about professional sports right now. Um, we have the Vegas Golden Knights and the Raiders just had their first game last night, uh, Monday night football, and we won in overtime. But we also have um, soccer emerging and basketball, and now we're the Oakland A's are also considering a move to Las Vegas. So we are really excited about professional sports here in our city. Our population is about 660,000 and growing. Uh, last year alone, we had more than 100,000 people move from, Los, from California uh, to Las Vegas. Uh, our county has more than 2.3 million. Our operating budget is $1.5 billion, um, 152 million in our CIP budgets. We have 3,325 employees and we're the fifth largest school district in the nation. Um, our Parks and Rec Department, we serve the community and lots of people from around the world as well. Um, one of our major events, the Mayor's Cup, which is a soccer tournament for youth, um, brings in hundreds of teams from around the world, and we're excited about that. We have 5.4 million users on our sports fields. We had 1.3 million uh, people attend our facilities, and we had more than 600,000 registered participants. Our budget's about 47 million. We have over 50 million in our capital budget for this next two years. We have 220 225 FTEs or full-time employees and more than 450 hourly employees. Um, some of the other numbers, 151 sports fields, six rec centers, five senior centers, six aquatic facilities, multiple sports complexes, four golf courses, and, and six other lease facilities that we provide to the community. Now, COVID-19 and the response, definitely uh, we have seen a new emerging services as a result of the uh, COVID-19 as, as many others have. Um, of course, we've, we started up with setting up testing stations and vaccination 
clinics. We're doing that now. We have uh, pop-up testing happening at multiple facilities. We also, at all, all our major special events now, we're doing vaccination clinics. Um, so we're trying to get as many people vaccinated as possible here in our community. Uh, one of the, the major results, which I think we've all seen around the world, is an increase in the amount of people who are participating in our parks. We are in the process of completing a new system master plan, Parks and Recreation System Master Plan for the city of Las Vegas. And we just got our surveys back. What a great time to do surveys post-pandemic or where we are right now. 87% um, of our re residents indicated that they visited uh, one of our city parks or our trails or our programs in the last year, making parks the most common connection residents have with the city. One of the programs that we, uh, emerging programs was our Healthy Parks Program, where when all of our centers close, uh, we, uh, we reassign those furloughs employee, furloughed employees to assist in our parks and our trails, where we obviously saw a major increase. Um, that, um, the numbers speak for themselves with the amount of parks that this, um, the crews were able to clean. Um, and I think the community was very appreciative, especially as we didn't, we didn't uh, know exactly how to keep um, everything clean properly. So, you know, we have 150 playgrounds that we needed to keep clean uh, while they were open and uh, having all these extra hands were, was hugely um, helpful. In addition, we now have had made this turn this into an hourly program. We have 50 hourly employees that have been, um, now that the, our centers are back open, this program's continued and it's been a, a big success for us. Community feud distributions is also something that's a new role for, for us. Uh, we, we had um, had some involvement with food distribution in the past, but as a result of the pandemic, and especially all of our senior centers closing, uh, we really increased our efforts and partnered with many local and national organizations um, and food pantries to help those in need. And we were able to provide more than 10,000 meals and more um, to our community in need during the pandemic. One of the other programs that we set up, which I'm really proud of, is our Vegas Strong Academy. As I mentioned earlier, our school district is the fifth largest in the country, and it shut down completely during COVID. There was um, uh, so what we set up was our Vegas Strong Academies at our uh, community centers, as as well as our libraries, and it started as an employee youth care program for essential employees, which then um, shifted to anyone and everyone who needed uh, uh, childcare. But we, we did online learning. Uh, we had, of course, recreation, physical ac ac education, and cultural arts all involved. And we were able to get grant funding to make sure that no child was turned away from this program. I think one of the most impressive uh, parts of our Vegas Strong Academy was this went on for 64 straight weeks. So our team of park and rec professionals were a, um, de facto teachers for 64 straight weeks, um, which was just unprecedented. And I'm super proud of our team uh, for their, their uh, resiliency um, to, you know, some of these, these kids were just, um, got so frustrated. I heard stories of throwing their laptops across the, the room and, uh, and our team was able to, again, uh, shift or pivot what we would traditionally do in our role of uh, park and rec professionals to being more of a teacher, and uh, but also mental health as well. And I think our, our team did an incredible job for 64 straight weeks helping kids who needed a place um, to go and learn and, and recreate. Uh, we also had no major COVID outbreaks um, at any of our facilities, as, uh, which was also a, a real kudos to our team. Uh, I think one of the major things we're working on now is smart parks technology. And that's to be have find more efficiencies in, in how we um, maintain our parks and recreation resources, but also using technology for the benefit um, for park safety and security. Um, things like drones. Uh, many of you I'm sure are aware of the October 1st um, tragedy that happened here in 2017, where uh, it was one of the largest um, mass casualty shootings, uh, active shooter incidents in, in, in the history of America. And that has definitely had us look at our uh, special events in a different uh, light. 
and trying to find new ways to make our special events safe and secure for all. And uh, technology is one way in which we're doing that. Uh, we're also looking at smart park cleaning technology. There's lots of new technology as a result of the COVID-19 that um, is allowing us to provide different new services in how we clean our facilities and protect our staff as well. So what I wanted to highlight was our new pilot uh, multi-purpose optical sensor program that we're piloting at in 15 different parks right now. And uh, these optical sensors are not just security cameras. They can provide alerts. They can um, uh, do things like uh, check license plates, check air quality, and of course, keep an eye on weather. Um, one of the other uh, programming options is a dashboard that we're creating with NTT, our, our partner in this project. Uh, where we're going to be linking our parks and maintenance staff as well as our Department of Public Safety uh, and our special events teams to really look at real-time view of park visitor counts, being able to look at um, everything from uh, sensors on our trash cans to um, what, what our visitor counts are and um, historical visitor counts. There's lots of things that we can do now and that we're unpacking uh, as we speak on, on how this new system will, will roll out. Um, a major part is park security and uh, having a smart park marshal where they can get alerts and, and sensors for uh, maybe uh, a new, numerous issues that could um, obviously come up, whether it's uh, you know, after hours issues or gunshots. Um, there's lots of things that this smart park technology can assist us. You know, we have a limited staff uh, as you, as we all are, um, and we're trying to use technology to help us where, uh, where we're short staffed to provide, you know, for example, we have um, 79 restrooms and we open all those restrooms um, in the morning, the Parks and Rec Department does, and in the evening, the marshals lock them all. Now, one of the things we're looking to do is automated uh, locks on those and sensors so that uh, we can uh, free up that staff time and the amount of fuel that's used and many other efficiencies that we can find with this, with this technology, but mostly it's about the safety of our park uh, users and our community. One other major um, emerging issue here is our climate and the climate change in Las Vegas. The Guardian had uh, this title, The Hellish Future of Las Vegas is in, in Climate Crisis, a play where, place where we never go outside. Well, that's not true. We definitely go outside. We're outside a lot, but uh, we used to count our days by 100 degree days. Now we're up to 110 degree days and how many consecutive 110 degree days. Um, it's definitely um, impacts our poorest residents who are most get, at risk for heat and um, also water conservation. You know, this is a major, major issue in our community right now. We're in a, in a drought and water conservation and how we're um, going to be building parks, especially turf grass going forward, is going to be very limited um, as, based on our water uh, on our on water conservation. Uh, we're looking to take out turf that is um, not used and uh, replace with uh, other recreational facilities that would do not require water. Um, so it's a it's a major turning point for us. We're in the process of a maintenance management plan right now. Uh, where we're analyzing all of our turf grass and looking for replacement uh, alternatives for that. Um, as as a, another major uh, initiative with regards to climate change is planting of trees. Um, we have a goal of planting 60,000 new trees by 2050. Uh, we just are now launching a legacy tree uh, remembrance program and tree growth sponsorships. And what I'm really proud of is we've established two nurseries um, city nurseries where we, we, we currently have over 5,000 trees that we're growing uh, so that they can handle the heat um, and not die um, if we put them out at too young. So really excited about our tree initiative here in Las Vegas. But to piggyback on uh, Donnie and her homelessness, we, we also have that major issue happening here and it's growing. We have uh, more than 5,000 homeless in the city of Las Vegas. And uh, we're trying to respond to that. Many of the homeless are, are in our park system. So we coordinate with our MORE outreach team and we are on the front lines, very much like Donnie. Um, our staff know many of these, the chronic homeless by their first names. We're getting to, uh, we, we know uh, those who need help. 
those who are new, and uh, we're the first line um, to call when we see issues and encampments uh, coming up in our parks. We have numerous parks where we have this issue, and uh, we are responding uh, with uh, numerous partners, including our Department of Public Safety, our Las Vegas Metro Police Department, but mostly community services. And uh, what we try to do is, uh, is help them where we need it, and where they need it most. And we have a homeless resource center where we uh, can uh, provide services for safety, housing, medical and mental health services, legal assistance. Uh, so what we try to do is get the homeless uh, out of our parks and take them to our courtyard homeless resource center, which is a comprehensive approach to addressing homelessness in our community. Um, it's a public private partnership that convenes a range of services, uh, working with Catholic charities and the Red Cross and many, many others, our county to assist us with this um, ongoing issue. Uh, one of the things that we've seen recently is with these heat waves is we're pivoting from um, serving our homeless outdoors to indoors. And here's just a, just a couple of weeks ago uh, where we opened up one of our, our gyms uh, due to excessive heat warning. And we had hundreds of, um, of homeless come and, and, and be able to get services and help that they need in our, in our gyms there. Um, so, uh, but the new, what, one of the new things we're building right now is a $15 million uh, courtyard homeless center and it will be a starting port point where homeless individuals can go to access resources all in one place. So there's some of the, the new role that we're playing here in Parks and Recreation. Um, and uh, I appreciate your time and, and uh, attention. And I look forward to any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Thanks, Greg, appreciate that. I'll jump right into the questions uh, with y'all. We have one here, um, back to you, Donnie. Can you share the formula and equation used to determine the number of indoor living spaces that were needed, or is it as simple as counting the number of outdoor homes? Thanks so much for that. I, I did um, uh, give you a, a typed response, but I'd like to elaborate a little bit more. Um, like Greg, we had folks on the ground from um, our outreach from the city um, who go in every day and go around the whole city and talk to people who are experiencing homelessness. Um, and that's to do a wellness check. That's to check to make sure that uh, they are aware of services that are available to them. It's for a number of reasons. So every day we had uh, folks going in first thing in the morning and, and you go early enough because then you're talking to the people who are actually sleeping in the encampment. Um, and it's a way to do a census to understand what services are needed. You know, it, are these folks a couple? Do they need to get into housing where they allow cats or dogs or whatever it may be? Uh, mental health services. What are you know? Are they a drug user or they maybe they're a drinker? Maybe they're neither, and maybe they want to be in a dry place. Um, so there's all all of these ways to do that census. So once every day we we had a kind of a, a different number. It would fluctuate. Um, but once we got to the point where we knew we had enough indoor spaces that was well uh, uh, surpassed the number of folks regularly sleeping in the park, that's when we were able to take action. That's great. A follow-up to both y'all that came to my mind, I'd like y'all to riff on this if you don't mind a bit. Um, let's look inward at our agencies. Uh, Greg, your agency and your staff members are being asked to do things now they may have never, never thought they would get into when they came into this career, career profession. Would you mind both of y'all maybe dig in for how you're helping your staff, A, keep them motivated, uh, prepare them, and then, you know, in the tragedies that we're, all of our staff are seeing now, how we help them recover as professionals and as family members? That's a great question, Scott. Thank you. Um, mental health and wellness is at the forefront of our response and trying to help our staff. 64 weeks. Think about teachers. You know, when I say 64 weeks of nonstop, imagine the burnout rate that they're feeling. And um, you know, teachers don't do that. And this, this, and by the way, I didn't say this was from six in the morning till six thirty at night every day. So, uh, health and wellness. We we had unfortunately two suicides in our department this past year, um, and so we we brought in some. Uh, we had some specialists come in, and we had a special suicide training and went um, um, and suicide awareness training. And we ended up not just having that for our department, but we opened it up to the entire city. And I think that was great that we can you know, use parks and recreation and that you know tragedy to help um, help our our teams. With health, with health and wellness. Uh, we're actually doing a mandatory training here in September where um, everyone in the department's gonna go through a day 
um, of, of training with regards to health and wellness as well. So I think that's an, an, a very, very important part uh, that we're, we're keeping a pulse on the health of our teams, especially as we're asking them to do things that um, this is not what they signed up for. I, you know, we have lost some staff members too, Scott, who said, look, this isn't, you know, I wanted to be in recreation. I wanted to be in parks and this is not what I signed up for. And, then, and I, um, I can appreciate that as well. Scott, I'll jump in too. Like Greg, we're doing um, a lot of training and some of the training we're doing is uh, um, cultural awareness as well as uh, harm reduction and, and trauma-informed uh, approaches to the services we provide. And especially if I, if I look at our, our park rangers who are the first ones on site, um, most of the time they're the one building that relationship. And you know, if we're not culturally aware, um, there are so many ways that we can be disrespectful and that we can cause further trauma. And, and we don't want to cause further trauma. We may not know how to deal with every situation, but we can at least try to be uh, reducing the trauma that we inflict. Great insights. Uh, picking up on that, because there'll be a lot of executives that, that fit into this. In the executive role you have, you've got the inputs coming up from the people you serve and the tactics you got to manage, and you have the strategy from your elected officials and your policymakers coming down, and y'all are right there. I mean, y'all are the ones that are asked front lines. solve this. Help our team think about how you do your job. How do you prioritize all these new demands with, oh, by the way, keep a restroom clean, Greg. Uh, Donnie, help us with our coyotes and, and managing our wildlife diversity yeah. in Stanley Park and all the challenges there. How do you all do it as human beings and as leaders in your position? You want to start, I'll, Donnie? I'll, I'll jump in, Greg. Thanks. Well, for me, uh, you know, definitely needing an outlet uh, beyond work. But, you know, sometimes when you get into this job, as, as, as you all know, um, it's a 24-7. So I've built up a really strong team. Um, and made sure that that we're all aligned in terms of our values and our approach. So I feel confident that I could step away and any one of my team could step in and, and make the same decisions and take the same approach as me. That, that was the first thing. Um, but the second thing is that we need to remember um, that that we're all experiencing trauma. You know, my mm -hmm. team has just gone through trauma. Like Greg said, you know, we're we're that our whole world is at that point where we're helping people through trauma, having being in it ourselves. So that mental health and that support um, um, otherwise and trying to figure out the, the laughter of it all. But you really you have to prioritize and you have to also you, you can't be a micromanager when you have big issues like this. You have to trust your team that they're going to go off and, and do the great work they do. You know, I think it starts with your work-life balance. I, I have to admit, I have not had a great work-life balance because we have over, we're overwhelmed. We're just overwhelmed with how much work that's happening. Um, so, but it starts with yourself and it, taking good care of yourself. I, you know, it's just the basics, eating well, getting your sleep, getting your exercise. If you, if you are taking good care of yourself, then I feel like you can take good care of your team. And speaking of the team, and I'm sure many of you who are watching, um, have not had an opportunity due to COVID to get your teams together. I think that's been a really difficult part because as parks and rec professionals, you know, we're all about building community and building each other up and lifting each other up. And we haven't had that opportunity. Thankfully, we just did that um, two weeks ago where we brought all 225 team members together and uh, everybody was really, there was some nervous folks that, that didn't want to, uh, uh, they were concerned about COVID. They were just concerned about coming together as a large group, but we put all sorts of safety measures in place. And then uh, they were also being, they're so burned out, Scott, and they didn't, they didn't want more training. So we were like, look, we're just gonna have fun and we're gonna come together as a team. And one of my, um, it was all about just taking care of ourselves and our, and our team. And we did multiple fun exercises, but I think one of my favorite parts was we did like end that song. And, and the whole group was singing together. Uh, all 200 of us were singing. And uh, there's, I don't think there's anything that builds teamwork more than the one when everybody sings together. I could just feel everybody's spirits lifting, right? Um, and feeling coming together, lots of laughters and smiles. And I said, that's what I wanted from this department meeting was not policy procedure. It was just, let's have fun. Let's um, break down um, and, and not work for a few hours and just try to enjoy each other and come together. And I think that that paid dividends. And we'll I love continue that. To. Let's um, 
I, I get to push two of y'all in most two of the most dynamic cities on the globe right now. So I'm gonna push in y'all a little bit. Um, let's let's do pivot back to park design. What yeah. what lessons are we learning about urban green space design after this? What did you learn? And if I turned both of y'all loose today and said 50 acre infill project, how does that public green space to you look different than today than maybe it did two years ago? And how is what we're going through now maybe shifting your thinking? about the programming and design of these spaces? I, I'll start, I, I, we, as I told you, we're in the, in the process of a system master plan and what a great time to go out and check with your community now where you know, they, they now appreciate parks and recreation more than they ever have before, right? So it does change the way we look and we're designing parks and we're such a booming city right now. We're grow, we, we are building so many parks and have so many, uh, we have, we have a lot of funding that's come down from the federal government, um, and there's there's a lot of money available, but it's the staff and resources to do it. And taking the time, Scott, to plan well as is the key, right? So that's the foundation on how we build going forward. But here's what we've heard from the community. Um, they want two major things here in Las Vegas was is trails. I mean, that's just off the charts. Um, so now every new park we're building is going to have a, a linear trail or, or exterior trail around it and interior trail within it. They also said they want more outdoor fitness and they don't necessarily want the stations. Believe it or not, they want to have these fitness courts, um, which brings people together. Right. Which uh, I think is really interesting. So I think that, um, the, you know, what we learn now is you can get together, you can be outdoors. And I think we're going to see more special events and, and more large scale um, pavilions that we need to build, not just smaller ones, uh, because more people are going to have their family reunions or their birthday parties outside rather than inside. So there's a, we're seeing a shift and there's just a couple of things, fitness, trails, uh, pavilions being larger. There's just three things, but there's many others we can talk about. Like I said, the conservation and the uh, uh, water usage, that is very, very high on our list here in Las Vegas. I'll let Donnie um, weigh in. <laughs> Maybe we're the Las Vegas North because uh, very similar, uh, very similar um, values and and you know uh, similar climates most of the time, except for our drastic rain season. But you know it's a it's a place where being outdoors is you can be outdoors here in Vancouver more of the year than in most parts of Canada. Um, and so yeah, people are drawn to be here, and it's our outdoor spaces. Uh, we just finished a master plan just before the pandemic hit, uh, uh, about a year or six months before that. Um, and never before has it been more important to have that, that focus and those values. And a big part of our master plan called Van Play um, was identifying equity zones. So mm -hmm. it was a really cool concept to look at not only where we had places who that didn't have as much green space that didn't have as many mm -hmm. amenities, um, but also we looked at all the different layering on of things to identify, hey, if we're going to add a playground. Do we add it in this equity zone or do we add it over here where, you know, they've got a, a you know, an abundance of, of things and, and it's really helped guide us in our decision making. Um, mm -hmm. Where do we have, where are we investing our money, but also how are we programming our space? Um, one of the things, you know, Greg, you said outdoor programs. Um, absolutely. We're finding, especially right now, uh, pop-up events, whether it's family mm -hmm. events yes. or large cultural events. Um, and, yes. and instead of uh, getting in the way and saying, oh, wait, you don't have a permit, um, we're looking at it saying, oh, yeah, how can we support you? Um, and taking kind of a community development approach to, okay, maybe this year we're supporting you a little bit more and maybe you'll do another event next year. But uh, really looking at what are these events that are helping a community to heal, because we all need to heal a little bit right now. And our, our parks and green spaces um, are critical for that healing. Um, I, I love to see, I, just last night I was walking in my local park and there was a group of folks playing some instruments and everybody in the audience had an instrument and then they would go into, you know, okay, everybody with a guitar, now you're going to play. And I was just like, this is a pop-up. Yeah. This is what we're going to see a lot more of. Donnie, I couldn't agree more. This is where parks and recreation plays a critical role and rebuilding our communities, right? Because what the pan pandemic and the lockdown lockdowns did was, of course, disconnected all of us. And parks, I think, more than any other 
um, facility we have in our cities can bring people together. When, I, when we asked our community just in the last couple of months, what did they want to see more of? Trails, fitness. The third thing was, Donnie, community special events. They want to have uh, excuses for to come out and get together with their neighbors and their community. So we got to do that. We're trying to boost up our special events here in the next year or two to provide more community special events for those who want it. And if I, Scott, I just want to jump no. in and say part of our role is to get out of the way. Yes. The power of empowering others, right? Yep. We had a, a, a question, Donnie, for you, and I, I love it because it's right back into the tactics and meat and potatoes. Look, we're, we're all struggling with dealing with houselessness and populations. And the fear is I'm going to do something wrong. Um, the, the terror is you hurt someone. The second terror is it shows up on the front page of a paper. Um, what, what, do you have any of the learnings from Strathconia that you can share with us, Donnie, that, that this audience would be like, hey, don't do this. I did this. I'm a knucklehead or try something a little different here that you could share with the group? Yeah, sorry, I, me I meant to share that. So thank you for asking. Uh, biggest, uh, there was a number, but the biggest mistake that uh, we made. So we fenced off, uh, we had the encampment fenced off. And on the other side, we had moved people indoors. And so we did the, you know, sign here, your stuff's going to go into storage. Um, and so we had a, a what we thought were abandoned tents and, and debris when it, but the folks who were still in the encampment viewed those things as those were our neighbors' homes and those are mm -hmm. our community. And, you know, when I look back, it was, yeah, that makes good sense. And at the time mm -hmm. I didn't make that connection. What, uh, what we were demonstrating was, yes, we're making progress on, you know, cleaning up this park. Um, and so we brought in the large mach machinery and start to, you know, pick up these, uh, what, what, you know, we thought were abandoned um, spaces and it was further traumatizing those who were still in the encampment on the other side of the tent so there was no rush to do that we didn't have to go in there and do that we could have just had it fenced off and waited um, the other thing uh, we also we, we worked really closely with a, what a, a model that's called a Pierce model and you're probably familiar with it but essentially we hired folks from the encampment or from the community to work mm -hmm. in the encampment in the community so we we didn't necessarily hire them, hire them bc housing did um, and so that partnership model was really good i would have invested a little bit more in that i would have invested in it as part of the decampment and then after people had decamped, whatever was left, um, had folks come back in to help take take the things that you can repurpose, take tents that you want, you, you know, that you can repurpose one day or whatever you see as valuable. Because just because I didn't necessarily or, or our folks didn't necessarily see things that were left as valuable didn't mean somebody else wouldn't. So to allow that time, um, and also, I mean, we did the community healing, we did the ceremonies, um, but to really, really make sure that we engage those peers to remediate the park afterward, to help bring it back to health. One of the things they wanted to do was to show the community that um, they weren't leaving behind, a, you know, this, what looked like, uh, uh, you know, a, a real disaster, but rather they were part of healing that space. So um, those are just a couple of things. And, and if you want to connect offline, I could give you a whole bunch of other mistakes I made. Well, Donnie, let me lean into this. And I'm going to push back into Greg too on this too. Um, we in the parks world have these things called third spaces a lot, which is lands that we own and manage, but we really don't manage because they're not active parks. I think we all know those spaces. Yeah. And those tend to accumulate a lot of the, the, the homeless yes. camps that begin yes. to brand it. Have maybe and Greg, I know you guys have those huge stormwater systems under Vegas yes. that have their own mm -hmm. thing going. Any insight for park leaders here with those third spaces? And I don't even know if that's the right term used, but you know the right of ways and the oh for sure. And uh, you know we have a, a maintenance and operations division that is dealing with this on a regular basis. And you're right, it's it's a it, it's a it's a continuous um, issue. So we'll go in and we'll post. Hey, we're gonna we're gonna move, and like Donnie said, we, we got to be respectful of people's property, uh, but get and giving them proper notice. Uh, but what we're doing, you know, for example, with the underground, um, we're clearing out those areas and then uh, fencing. And what we're doing a lot of fencing actually of these smaller areas. So you know, the underpasses, uh, we're they're all fenced off. So it's sort of like you know, we find one area. 
we clear them out, we clean it up, we fence it. <laughs> and then we, but we, it, it seems that we, you know, we're just kind of moving the problem, yeah. right? So we, we move, we, for example, we'll move them, uh, move, move them out of one park and they'll move just to another. What we, what we want them to do is take advantage of the resources that we have. We have lots of services that are available, but many are chronically homeless and they, they are not interested in the services. So there's where we run into our issue, right? Is those who, who don't want the services that we provide, but still want to loiter and, and camp out in our parks. And that's where we, where we have to bring in the marshals and say, this is just a, isn't permitted. You know, now it does, that sounds great, but it doesn't work in, in reality. We have several parks that are, are regularly um, overrun by homeless. And we've had other parks that they've we've shut down completely, completely closed and fenced. We have two parks right now that are completely closed as a result of not being able to control this homeless issue. Now, uh, one of our council people wants to reopen one of these parks, but she doesn't want to repeat this, the mistakes of the past. So we're having multiple community meetings, neighborhood meetings, and asking, and the community does the same. The neighborhood doesn't want to see the park uh, become that homeless shelter eater. We would like the homeless to go where the resources are, um, which is many, many, many millions of dollars that we're providing for those. Uh, but, you know, Scott, it's, it, it, it's, it's, it's almost on a weekly basis that we're going in and we're, we're clearing up these areas and it just seems to keep moving. You're right, especially in those, those spaces where um, they, they, they want to be able to stay, right? They don't want to have to be moved on. And if I could offer it here, you know, folks have the right to, to shelter overnight in our parks. Uh, they just have to, they're supposed to be, uh, you know, uh, packed down and mobile by, you know, early morning, 8 a.m. Um, and so we have spaces where they can actually, uh, you know, definitely shelter overnight. It's, it's, the, it's, it's the packing down. But a couple of disconnects um, I'm finding, and I'm, I'm no homelessness expert, right? But understanding that if, if folks aren't taking the services that are there, it's, under, it's talking to the folks about, well, what services would help? And, and, and I know that that sounds really simple. And it was, it was a conversation I was in yesterday about, like, you're offering, you know, your colonial services, but those aren't the right services for us. And one of the things that I've learned is that people still want that community. They want that, that ability to be in that space and to spend their days uh, with their their family, in many cases, their family, and figuring out how to um, still do that. So programming in our parks so that while they might be uh, uh, sheltering overnight, or maybe they're, they're indoors overnight, that they're able to come back to the park space and feel like it's still their park versus, you know, and, and we still have a park, Oppenheimer Park is still fenced off. Um, it's been fenced for over a year. We worked with the community. We did an indigenous healing of the park. We did an indigenous um, a ceremony to reopen the park. And we worked with all the community um, agencies and partners and, and local surrounding uh, residents uh, and folks from the homeless community to say, how can we reopen this park safely? Because the same thing, they said, we don't want it to be uh, taken over by tents again. We want people in the park during the day and, and most likely homeless people because it's in the downtown east sides. It's, it's, it's in a space where there's not a lot of green space. Mm -hmm. um, so the fencing is there, but there's an intention to remove it over time once there's a, um, enough programming happening, enough things going on in the park that people feel welcome and safe there, but also know that, that they're not gonna be, they're not gonna be uh, built, uh, setting up an encampment in this particular park again. Scott, one thing I wanted to bring up too was the safety of our staff. And, mm -hmm. you know, some of the chronic homeless, like I said, they know the staff are on the front line. So they're seeing them on a daily basis. We have some bad actors out there. We've had our, the lives of our staff threatened on more than one occasion with knives pulled out and, you know, physical altercations when they're just trying to clean the restroom, right? So this is a major issue for my staff. And I hear it on a regular basis where they're like, they're getting more, you know, they can tell they, they like got the pulse. They're like, Hey, things are, you know, uh, are escalating out there. We can sen sense the tension. Mm -hmm. um, and then wouldn't you know it, we had a shooting right the next day. Um, so I, I think that was um, very um, intuitive of our staff to that. That shows how much they know mm -hmm. th that there's issues out there that, um, and then the other thing is we'll, you know, we'll have this person that, keeps coming back to the same 
location gets thrown, you know, he's violent, gets thrown in jail, comes back, back to the park again. And so this is a, it keeps repeating and, and staff um, are saying, we got to do something about this. So, um, you know, while I'm very compassionate for those who, who are down and trodden, you know, the, um, our court list, our, our, our courtyard uh, accepts anyone, pets, if you're on drugs, it doesn't matter. You can go there and have a safe place to spend the night, get food and water. Um, so that's where we're trying to, you know, there's no, no restrictions. You just can go there. That's where, where you can get your best help. Um, so, but I just wanted to bring that up. It's, not, it's part of the equation that I hear regularly from my staff that they're, they're getting more and more fearful from some of the aggressive um, individuals that are out there. And mostly it's, it's around mental health, right? And so, um, and we've got, I want to be sensitive to folks' time because y'all have been so generous sharing yours and you have huge departments and responsibilities. So thank you, Donnie and Greg. Um, your, your relationship with your police department, uh, your law enforcement folks, uh, for coaching people on the call, if you have any, has it been strengthened through this? Because it feels like we're all in whack-a-mole mode right now. Yeah. Um, but we've got to get beyond that at some point. And that seems to be a relational piece that you both touched on, but we haven't really talked about uh, for your rangers and their interface with your law enforcement folks. Sure. So, so I'll just jump in. Our, <clears throat> our uh, uh, law enforcement takes a, um, a supportive role, uh, but when we did the decampment, they weren't even on site. They were um, in mm -hmm. the neighborhood uh, available for a call. Our rangers don't do enforcement. They do outreach and education uh, more than anything. But I th I'm just, I'll just leave it with this. I think the most important thing in dealing with some of these urban issues is that we cannot continue to work and, and not to say Greg and I, I don't think do, but, but as an industry, we can't continue to work in a vacuum. We mm -hmm. have to be partnered with health. We have to be partnered with social services and outreach, and we have to all be doing our part. Um, uh, this is a work together approach, a community development approach to this because um, not one person can be handled with just the same, you know, approach as, as the next. Everybody's got their own needs. We have an excellent working relationship with our chief, our lieutenants, our, our captains, our sergeants. We are a first name basis with these, with our, with these depending on, you know, where they are in our, in our city. Very, very strong working relationship with them. So we have a metropolitan police department and then our department of public safety is marshals, which are technically park rangers, but they do a myriad of other services. Um, so we have a very strong working relation. We're on a regular daily communication with them and we're improving that because um, uh, it's, it's all about rapid response, right? If we can respond quickly to uh, the encampments before they get too large, then it, it's, it, you know, it's helpful. So, um, you know, even if we start to see in, in, a, in a park, an obscure park um, and an encampment starting, we're on the phone, we're emailing, we're letting them know so we can get on it right away. So couldn't, couldn't say enough. And then I, as I talked about in my presentation, using technology, trying to have the tools to assist our DPS to do their job more efficiently and effectively. And, and partnering with that is helpful, right? When it comes to funds, when you have multiple departments going before council saying, hey, we think we have some solutions, but we need your assistance, financial help. Uh, that lends a lot more weight than just one department, right? We have multiple departments working together. So, um, Scott, you're right. It's absolutely critical that you have a, a great working relationship with your um, your police and, and marshals. Well, you all have been great. Um, thank you very much for your time. I'm sure you're both, uh, the emails will be in here. If folks want to reach out to you, you wouldn't mind one bit at all. You all, you all are both. Yeah, one thing I wanted to mention, colleagues. Scott. One yeah. thing I wanted to mention and I forgot was we have a vulnerable population policy that others may be interested in. And oh. it's something that we've developed a couple of years ago. Um, it's very comprehensive. And if anyone's interested, you can send me an email and I'll make sure you get it out to you. Great. Uh, yeah, that would be great, Greg. That'd be wonderful. Well, thank both of y'all very much. Thank everyone that tuned in now and will tune in later. Um, we appreciate y'all and, and everyone's time and just encourage everyone to uh, protect yourselves. Be careful. Go get your damn vaccination if you haven't already or I will come punch you in the face. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we'll uh, we'll make sure it works for everybody. Michael, Thanks. MJ, Thanks thank you all so much, Canada, for helping out. And everyone, stay safe out there. See you all. Thank you so. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, Donnie.